This is the story of one of the worst air crashes ever to occur on the mainland of Britain. 47 people were killed as the aircraft, a British Midland Boeing 737-400, crash-landed on the M1 motorway. This amateur footage, shot just hours before takeoff, shows the aircraft that embarked on flight BD-92. The aircraft was on a double shuttle flight between London Heathrow and the Northern Ireland city of Belfast. Carrying 118 passengers and eight crew, the aircraft left Heathrow just before 2000 hours and began to climb towards its cruising altitude of 35,000 feet. But 13 minutes later, as the aircraft was passing through 28,000 feet, the crew and the passengers became aware of a low repetitive thudding noise, similar to a car backfiring. The three rear flight attendants saw evidence of fire from the left engine, and one of the forward flight attendants noticed that the vibration was strong enough to shake the walls of the forward galley. Some passengers could see fire from the left engine and saw light-colored smoke in the cabin. They described a smell of burning as being similar to rubber, oil, and hot metal. In the flight deck, the cockpit crew also noticed a strong smell of burning and reported seeing smoke. The pilots interpreted this as an engine fire, despite the fact that no fire indication was given by the warning system. The commander disengaged the autopilot and took control of the aircraft. He checked his instruments, but could not gain a clear indication of what had caused the problem. He asked his first officer which engine was causing the trouble. The first officer replied, it's the left, it's the right one, changing his sentence in mid-word. The commander ordered the first officer to throttle back the right engine. As he did, the shuddering from the left engine stopped, persuading the crew they had dealt correctly with the problem. Soon after, the smell and smoke cleared from the flight deck, further convincing the crew that the action they had taken had been correct. Shortly after this, the commander ordered the right engine to be shut down. At this stage, the left engine appeared to be functioning normally. The first officer then advised London Air Traffic Control that they had an emergency situation which looked like an engine fire and told them of their intention to divert to East Midlands Airport. The commander called the purser to the flight deck and asked him if he and the passengers had seen smoke in the cabin. He was told that they had. The purser was then instructed to clear up the cabin and pack everything away. One minute later, the purser returned to the flight deck and said to the commander, sorry to trouble you, but the passengers are very, very panicky. To calm the passengers, the commander broadcast a message on the cabin address system. He told them that there was trouble with the right engine, which had produced some smoke in the cabin. As a result, he said, that the engine was now shut down and that they were diverting to East Midlands Airport, where they expected to land in about 10 minutes. Many of the passengers who saw fire from the left engine were puzzled by the commander's reference to the right engine, but none brought it to the attention of the flight attendants. Unfortunately, none of the flight attendants heard the commander referring to the right-hand engine, so although many people knew it was the left engine that was causing the trouble, nobody reported this. Due to the diversion, the workload in the flight deck remained heavy. The first officer obtained details of the weather at East Midlands Airport and attempted to program the flight management system to show the landing pattern. In the short time available, the commander and first officer tried to review their actions in the emergency situation, but they were constantly interrupted from doing so by radio messages to and from air traffic control. The aircraft continued on its approach to East Midlands Airport and at 3,000 feet and 13 nautical miles from touchdown, Air traffic control advised a right-hand turn to bring the aircraft onto the runway center line for the approach. To level the aircraft, the commander required further power from the damaged left engine. This caused substantial shuddering and vibration to reappear. One minute later, and at 2.4 nautical miles from touchdown, there was an abrupt decrease in power from the left engine. The commander called for the first officer to restart the right engine but this was not possible in the time available. 
The commander then raised the nose in an effort to reach the runway. The fire warning alarm operated from the left engine and the ground proximity warning system sounded and continued to sound with increasing repetitive frequency as the aircraft descended below the flight path. On the ground, eyewitnesses could see the aircraft was in trouble. Ignited debris could be seen falling from the engine. By now, the shuddering and vibration was so severe that some of the overhead lockers opened and spilt their contents onto passengers. Ten seconds before ground impact, the commander broadcast an announcement. Prepare for crash landing. Prepare for crash landing. The aircraft first hit the ground in a field adjacent to the M1 motorway. Soon after the aircraft crashed, the fire in the port engine ignited trees and bushes in the immediate vicinity. Aviation fuel was in danger of igniting. Fire engines quickly arrived to extinguish the fire. Foam was applied first to the port engine and then in a sweeping motion across the wings and fuselage. This was the scene within minutes of the crash. Only 14 of the 126 passengers were able to make their own escape. Did some people actually manage to get out off the, on their own stage? Yeah, well, the first person I saw was a steward walking around. Um, he, he just didn't know what was happening. He just said the plane came from Heathrow and there was, there was over 100, 100 people on board. And uh, he, he was just completely gone in shock. And, uh, yeah, there were... It was a mess, yeah. We, I, don't, I don't know how many survived. I, I know we had the two pilots out. I got the two pilots out. The fireman done a brilliant job. In the flight deck, both pilots were seriously injured and trapped. One of the front flight attendants was also trapped, and another at the rear was trapped by a food services trolley which had fallen against her. The interior of the cabin was a scene of devastation. At the front, the floor had disintegrated from the main fuselage, severely trapping the passengers. At the rear, the floor had collapsed into the cargo hold, trapping many others. Overhead storage lockers and ceiling panels had collapsed onto passengers throughout the aircraft. Some of the passengers had adopted the correct crash position, but not all. Some had rested their heads on forearms prior to the impact, fracturing their arms as a result. Other passengers, who had braced themselves by placing their extended arms onto the back of the seat in front, fractured upper arms and shoulder joints. During the crash, the occupants of seats were thrown forward, their knees hitting the back of the seat in front. The force of the collision caused a variety of injuries such as dislocation of the hip, fractures of the hip joint and fractures of the pelvis. Many passengers also suffered head and facial injuries. 
Outside the aircraft, human chains were formed to pass casualties down to the ambulances waiting on the hard shoulder. RAF helicopters were used to transport some of the most severely injured casualties to hospitals. By daybreak, the full impact of the carnage became apparent. Of the 118 passengers and eight crew, 38 died in the wreckage, whilst a further nine died after being removed to hospital. 74 passengers were seriously injured. The fatalities were located in the following places. We were sitting in the very first row, in the very front on the right hand side, and there was a very loud bang. We just had our dinner, in fact, served in front of us. Loud bang. Uh, quite unmistakably to me, anybody who's flown on a plane, it was an engine. Uh, the bang actually made the plane shudder, and then it was like running over cat's eyes, very big cat's eyes in the road. It was sort of backfiring every few seconds. There was a smell of, uh, of smoke, a burning smell in, 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 the, in the atmosphere. I couldn't actually see any smoke, physically see any smoke, but there was a, this, this sort of pervading smell of a stench of burning, you know, like sort of burning rubber. The pilot then came on very quickly and was very reassuring. He actually came on and said, Sir, very sorry, ladies and gentlemen, for any inconvenience, the slight discomfort you just experienced. It was an engine. Uh, it was our right engine. However, we've rectified it and we've now shut it down. I've spoken to people who sat beside the engine that was on fire and they had this unerring belief, this engine's on fire, the pilot knows what he's doing. I've obviously misheard when he said he, he shut down the wrong engine. He obviously didn't. He knows what he's doing. And the guy does, but the guy can't see the engine, but the passenger could. There was another gentleman who actually was the chief steward. He ended up sitting beside me in the crash, and he, in fact, then allocated the air hostesses. For, again, I was very impressed with it, <laughs> sitting at the front, sort of watching this. It gave you a certain amount of confidence. What he actually did was I could overhear him talking to them, and he went through them on the grounds of, you've done this drill last month. You haven't done this drill. Have you done it? Right, you go to the back. I'll stay up here. I'm uh, quite fresh with this one and he actually allocated the sort of crew in the, the sort of steward end, in, in the actual... He, <coughs> he, he distributed the actual cabin crew where he felt they would be sort of best equalised, so he had a reasonably experienced crew at the back and a reasonably experienced crew at the front. I mean, I've heard so many times in the, in the press people saying, you know, yes, there's a lot of vibration. It, it was indescribably horrendous. It, it, there's nothing... I, I, I can't actually begin to describe what it was like. The, the only the closest thing to it is just to say that if you're if you're in a disco and you're sitting next to somebody and it's really loud music, and you actually have to shout into their ear to make them hear you. It was so loud you wouldn't have even have been able to hear yourself shout. Um, not only that, the aircraft was vibrating so much that if you'd been looking at a, at a magazine, you wouldn't even have been able to read the letters had they been the size of the page. It was it was just like your whole body was vibrating and it was so strong that I thought that if this goes on for any longer, the aircraft's actually going to fall apart. I mean, I fully expected that the, the, the fuselage just, just to disintegrate. People talk about vibration, but they have no idea what the vibration level on that plane was like. At the very end, before the actual impact, the vibration was such you couldn't have stood up. You couldn't have read a foot-high sign saying emergency or exit. I mean, you, if you'd screamed, you wouldn't have heard yourself scream. And uh, I remember thinking, you know, we're going we're gonna to crash, I'm going to die. This is, this is it, you know, it's all over. I mean, I, I remember thinking, what have I done? You know, what a waste, this is, it's the end. And uh, I, I thought, the last thing I remember thinking was, nobody survives a plane crash. I wonder, will I? The, the pilot then, in fact, came on to the actual intercom again and said, prepare for crash landing. I thought, what, crash landing? I sort of, I mean, this is a silly, no one says that in a plane. Well, but I didn't actually know until 15 seconds before we hit the ground that we were definitely going to crash so I only had 15 seconds to be really frightened and I mean when the captain came on and said prepare for crash landing and I got into the crash or got, got down I it was a half-hearted attempt to, to get into the crash position I, I I really didn't believe that it was happening I it was like being in a dream I mean it was 
it was ludicrous. I, how could I possibly be in a plane that was actually going to crash? You know, these things, they don't happen to me. They happen to other people. It was absolutely immense, the actual impact when we hit the ground. It was just a complete and utter crushing. Only it didn't stop. It wasn't like an impact if you fall off a chair onto the ground. You hit, and we seemed to just keep moving and keep being crushed and keep being pressed, and the pressure just didn't relent. And I remember in the back of my head noises of, I can remember people's screams. I can remember noises of things breaking up and just collapsing and falling apart. But I, at that point, I, with my injuries, I was unconscious. Yeah, the flight attendants during this whole sort of incident um, frankly acted very, obviously very well trained. They acted calmly. They, they operated very, very quickly. Whenever they were putting things away, they would be doing it very quickly. But they were doing it quickly, but not running. They weren't uncontrollably running about the place. They weren't panicky. They certainly wouldn't have made you feel particularly panicky. They were, if anything, trying to inspire that confidence. On one occasion, one of the girls, in fact, did start to cry, and the others immediately, if you like, shielded her and sent her in out of sight from the passengers so that the passengers only viewed people in control. I came to, uh, I was slumped forward, and I, I sat up, uh, and I thought, I'm alive. There's going to be a fire. Get out. And I realised we'd crashed, and I, as, I, as I stood up, my seatbelt held me back and I undid the seatbelt. The seat actually had moved slightly with me. And uh, undid, I undid the seatbelt and I stood up and I moved across to the left. As I moved across, I was aware of, of one of the stewardesses in her jump seat sitting just slumped. And I, I mean, I remember at the time thinking she's unconscious, uh, but I, I had no, my only desire was to get out of the aircraft before the fire started. There was a small engine fire which occurred immediately after the impact, which was actually put out by the fire service. Uh, if that fire had taken hold, that everybody in the fuselage would have been killed. The M1 Kegworth air disaster highlighted a number of important training points for airlines to prepare crew for a similar emergency situation. These include, the cabin crew should assume that the flight deck are not aware of any unusual circumstances, including noises and smells, and should report them immediately. Cabin crew must pay attention to the reactions of passengers in case they have knowledge of a situation that the cabin crew and flight deck are unaware of. This includes circumstances which occur inside or outside the aircraft, including unusual noises and smells. Cabin crew must pay full attention to all flight deck announcements. The crash landing itself taught us other lessons the importance of the correct stowage of items that could move around the cabin during an emergency landing, the necessity of informing passengers of the correct brace position and other emergency procedures, the importance of being prepared for more than one impact on emergency landing, the importance of a rapid evacuation in the event of a crash landing. Britain's Air Accidents Investigation Branch has issued 31 safety recommendations after the investigation. These include air traffic control to consider the use of a discrete radio frequency for use of aircraft in an emergency. Training exercises in response to emergencies should be combined for flight deck and cabin crew. Research to be intensified for the use of external and internal closed circuit television. Flight deck training to be enhanced in technical appreciation of how the aircraft systems and instrument display will respond during abnormal and emergency circumstances. Engine instrument systems should include a facility to alert the cockpit crew to each vibration indicator during maximum vibration. And finally, research to be accelerated into passenger seat design with emphasis on effective upper torso restraint and aft facing seats to minimize injury on impact. Disasters on this scale can occur to any type of aircraft, to any airline, and in any part of the world. It is hoped that this program has given you more of an understanding of the safety factors involved to assist in your training requirements.